Hi, it's Phil from Inclusive Music, teaching the world to make music with technology. This is going to be a slightly unusual video in that today I'm going to be looking at technology, music technology that is hundreds of years old. And to do that, I thought there is no better person I know than my dear friend, Anthony Noble. We're going to be looking at clavichords, harpsichords, and the first pianos. Check this out. So, this is my friend Anthony, and I've popped in to see him today as the incredible musician that he is. And uh, we go back, I think, nearly 50 years. Yeah. And interestingly enough, he's a classical musician and has had a, a very impressive career doing what he does with organs and um, teaching and harp scores now. And I've gone in completely the opposite direction and done it with technology. So here we meet again. 50 years later, looking at his um, unbelievable collection. Yes. Thank you, Anthony. So let me ask you a question. Yes. Tell me about the technology of the harpsichord. The technology of the harpsichord. Because um, it is in the day. In the day, it's quite interesting because it uses um, all sorts of things that were being developed at the time. Wire drawing for making very thin wires. Um, pin makers in Paris, when at the period the original of this was built, pin, pin makers, their pins were used as the axle for the for the jack, so that the tongue could swing back and forth on it. Um, other than that, it's, it's instrument making technology going back a very long time. The idea of a soundboard, a resonant body, uh, with, with the top being um, usually some sort of spruce that, was, uh, uh, that could vibrate freely by being made very thinly. It's exa exactly the same as, as the top of a Stradivarius violin. Um, so that side of it's there. The rest of it's really quite simple. I mean, the idea of a wooden stick with a swinging or um, tilting tongue in it, a tiny bit of quill, and I use real quill in these, so this one's mostly goose quill. Um, actually, it's not very good. I prefer turkey. That little one is in all in turkey. But, um, Another thing I can't do now is very easily cut quills. I have been doing, I did yesterday. And some of the jacks, the wooden bits, have got blood on them. <laughs> oh. I know. Hey ho, mine, not the turkeys or the gooses. Anyway, but yeah, I mean, uh, they're simple instruments, really. They're based on balance and, and pivot points, and all of that sort of has an importance in the whole thing. Uh, and the raw materials, this is, both of these are very, very authentic in terms of raw materials. So this is quill and so is that. And then they both have um, hogs bristle springs. So the, um, I can show you on this one actually. On the, um, the jacks, it's easy to get them out of here, that's all. So, um, so there's the jack and it, this tongue tilts. And when it plucks the string, it's fixed in position. But then when it comes down again, it tips back so that it doesn't pluck the string as it goes down and then pings back into place. And what causes it, the spring that fixes here is a hog's bristle, which sort of is woven into the bottom part of the jack and then up there. So it's got sort of tension on it. And it's that that um, 
um, it means that the, the whole thing returns properly. There we go. So uh, if I use the other one, you can see actually if you're filming, you can see this way. And the thing that you can really tell with the sound of a real harpsichord, although I think a lot of the electronic ones do it now, is at the end of the chord, when you release it, there's that click mm. like that, which is the sound of all of the, the, the tongues moving back into position, powered by the hog's bristles. Um, but apart from that, very straightforward. I mean, this side of it, and that has levers to do this job, but these are a little bit like organ stops, so there are two strings for each note. Um, one plucking that way, and the other plucking that way, and they're set up so that if you play them very slowly, the back one plucks first. Um, so they don't pluck at exactly the same time, so you don't get lots of hard, aggressive pluck in the sound. It's slightly staggered. And that's it. And they're not that complicated, and the action is really very simple. Uh, these just sit on the end of the key, the key lifts out, and that's it. When was a harpsichord created? Earliest harpsichord seemed to be round about 1500, maybe a bit before, but uh, the, there's more evidence in things like carvings and things like that for early instruments perhaps than there is for actual instruments surviving. I can't remember the date of the earliest instrument. Royal College of Music Museum has a very early instrument, which I might be 14, late 1400s. I'm not sure, can't remember. Can't remember the details, but there we go. Hmm. This is uh, a piano from the, well, actually about 1790 or 91. It says 1796, I think, on that label there. Um, <clears throat> but the inside here is a serial number, and the serial number dates this instrument to about 1790-91. Um, then it clearly went back to the makers, probably at this date, because if you look here, there's, um, a, you can see that this bit of wood has been added here, and you can also see that's there. Originally, the keyboard stopped with that note there, and this came up to there, and what they've done is chopped it out. You can just yep. about see the lines there. Beautifully done, though. Put this extra bit of wood in here, um, shortened this here, and it's allowed them to add these notes. And these notes have got slightly different ends on them. They don't quite match. Oh, yes. Um, and at that period, when this instrument was made, instead of having a pedal to do the sort of sustaining job, uh, it had a lever in there. But if you, if you can see in there, there are the screw holes where the lever was. And what they did instead was did what grand pianos had already started doing, and obviously all pianos do, they transferred that lever mechanism to uh, a pedal. Because with the lever mechanism, it was on or off. So it was like a kid putting their foot on the loud pedal and just playing the whole way through, never taking their foot off. Um, but actually, obviously, of course, you use pedals quite differently. So this is, um, this is a piano from um, early 1790s. And it was sold by Longman and Brodrip, who were the great uh, musical instrument and music retailers of the period. It was actually made by three separate makers. Um, Culliford, Barrow and Rolfe and um, there's an interesting sort of social history thing of nothing to do with this piano particularly except from that those three makers are, are quite interesting they, they made instruments under their own names Culliford had been a great heart school maker as well but um, Culliford's daughter married uh, Burrow the, um, the, 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 and they had a daughter uh, who was Charles Dickens' mother Wow. So there you go. But this is a... Thank you. 
Well, nearly right. It's a bit out of tune. It needs tuning. But the weather's been not kind to these instruments. But it's pretty, isn't it? Very nice. Very. So that's that is the sound you would have heard. Beethoven would have heard. Mozart. People like that would have heard. Haydn, particularly actually, because Haydn was in England in the seventeen nineties. Um, he spent a protracted period in London. Um, and this is the, these are the instruments they would have heard. They, there were also grand pianos at that point, harpsichord-shaped pianos. But this type of instrument, square pianos, were made in vast quantities, which is why there are still so many around. Um, and a lot of them are, have been either completely, or as this one has partially restored, uh, this has new strings, but the leather covering hammers in those days were tiny and they weren't covered in felt like modern pianos, but they're, they're covered in layers of leather um, and this still has the original leather on, on, on the hammers. And what all, nearly all square pianos do is they twist slightly. So I've made this piece of wood here to go underneath this to support it because actually the tension of the strings like that twists them slightly. And um, it's, you know, as long as it doesn't go too far, it's okay. Sometimes it pulls them apart. And in the fireplace in the sitting room, there's one um, which in the 19th century was turned into a sort of um, console table with drawers in it. And that's clearly had twisted and pulled apart so much it had become un unusable because it's actually split, that the instrument is split away from the baseboard just along here. Um, and that's not uncommon. So there we go. Okay, so this is, this is my, my uh, favourite instrument uh, in some ways. It's my, my pride and joy. And it's made by a chap called Peter Paddington, whoops, who is probably the world's greatest clavichord maker. I mean, there are a number of very good ones in Europe, but he is stunning. Unfortunately, he's just retired. He's Sorry, Peter who? Peter Bavington. Okay. There's a little label, actually. So it's, it's modern. Yeah, it's a copy. It's like all these instruments. It's apart from the piano. It's yeah. actually a reproduction. And um, this particular clavichord is unique. There are what, what most clavichord makers do, and Peter has done extensively, is to make replicas of old instruments, like the harpsichords are replicas of old instruments. Um, this uh, we call Mersenne. Um, Mersenne was a, 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 a 17th century French priest, philosopher, theologian, scientist, acoustic engineer, you name it. He did absolutely everything, a real polymath. And um, this is the only instrument that's, uh, of its kind. Uh, we know that the French had clavichords because they crop up quite frequently in when people do an inventory at the end of uh, someone's life. You know, they're going through a musician's possessions or a, a, a harpsichord maker, instrument maker's workshop. You see them listed, you see them mentioned in text, but not one French clavichord seems to have survived, whereas pretty well everywhere, possibly except in England's a bit, I'm sure, but uh, most parts of the world, clavichords were very, very popular. They were the favorite practice instruments of organists. And we've got numerous uh, examples that have survived right from very early on. They seem to predate the harpsichord, uh, right up until they were still being built in quite large quantities, particularly in Scandinavia, well into the 19th century. So they never entirely went out of fashion. By the time they were stopped building them, um, in, the, in, in, the, in Scandinavia in the 19th century, they were beginning to come back into favour for people who were interested in uh, historical instruments. So anyway, no French instruments, but um, Mersenne, and there's a print of Mersenne, this is an 18th century print of Mersenne up here, um, uh, Marin Mersenne, and he uh, wrote a book that was published, I think, in the late 1630s, um, Armony Universelle, uh, which uh, was also published in Latin for, for swats. But um, it was a, a, a book which talked about all aspects of music, but particularly interesting is the section on organology, on, on musical instruments, where he gives quite detailed diagrams and very detailed descriptions of the instruments. And we know they're accurate because obviously a lot of the instruments he was describing and drawing diagrams of um, are still extant. You, you know, there are copies of uh, you know, uh, instruments, sorry, not copies, but there are original instruments, organs, harpsichords, cornets, recorders, all sorts of instruments that he mentions. 
uh, uh, still exist in museums. Um, but no clavichords. So what Peter Babington set out to do was to use Mersenne's descriptions and diagram to build this instrument. And it was a, it was a, a, a project that took him quite a few years, but he, he completed it about 10 years, just over 10 years ago. Um, various people had played it, various people had played it. Uh, my friend Terry Charleston, who's professor of historical keyboard instruments at the Royal College, made a CD on it. So it, I knew it was there. And then... Um, I was about to give up the college here and had a little bit of money and I was on the British Clavichord Society's committee uh, and I said to uh, Judith, who's his sort of partner, did she think Peter wanted to sell it because he'd never sold it before, it had just been kept as a sort of, it had gone out for hire and things. And uh, he did, so I'm the lucky possessor and I think the envy of many of my friends in the clavichord world. Um, but beautiful, really an astonishing instrument. I haven't played it for a little while because I've been playing organs and harpsichords, but... It's a very gentle sound, um, but it does have the, the advantage, which harpsichords don't have, but pianos do, of being able to alter the volume, uh, able to alter the volume by how hard you hit it. And how did it achieve that? But, well, you, the, the, so the system is quite simple again. It, like a piano, the strings are struck. If you strike a string, the more force you strike that string with, if you can control that force, the louder the sound. Harpsichords, because they're dependent on the strength of the quill, you know, a very thick quill uh, will pluck with great force because it'll take a long, it'll pull the string a long way before it finally pings mm. past it. So one of the things you have to do with a scalpel, hence the blood, <coughs> is to thin these quills on the underside to get them to be the same volume as the others. But with this, these, uh, they're called tangents. They're like sort of, I don't know what you call them, the blade of a screwdriver, really. This has very long ones, these brass tangents. I don't know if you can see this piece of the light here. It doesn't really make a lot of difference, does it? But these, these strike the string. And they work in, they do two jobs, actually. One is they obviously cause the string to vibrate. But the other is they fix the length of the string. Um, so on a harpsichord, the string is fixed on a bridge at one end and a nut at the other end, and that's its vibrating length, rather like uh, on a violin, uh, and they go across the bridges. But on this, the strings are fundamentally, shouldn't really do this, but the strings are fundamentally dead because of all this felt, they call it listing, all this felt woven in here makes the string dead. Um, but when you play a note, the string then vibrates between that tangent, wherever it is, I can't see, and its bridge at the end there. 
Uh, and the advantage of that is, if you think it is an advantage, is you can actually use two uh, use one set of strings as a pair of strings for each note. One set of strings can actually produce two different notes. So C and C sharp share the same set of strings, which means if I'm playing C sharp and do that, I just get a C sharp there. Um, so uh, these are called fretted clavichords. It reduces the number of strings on the instrument, cuts down tuning time, it also cuts down the weight on the soundboard there um, and obviously allows it to vibrate more freely. The more strings there are on, a, on it, the heavier the, the, you know, the, 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 the sort of string weight, as it were, on, on the bridge is, the less free to vibrate the sound. So it's not a loud sound, but it is potentially not. Um, now, the other advantage of having the string directly touching the string, uh, sorry, the tangent directly touching the string is, unlike any other keyboard instrument, you can control the sound of the note once you've played it. With the piano, you hit the string and the hammer falls away. With the harpsichord, the quill plucks the string and then it's past it. But on this, you hit the string and you stay in place. That means you can do this. Oh. Sort of aftertouch, as we call it. Yeah, bay boom. In technology. Is, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah, that's exactly it, isn't it? So you can control what happens to the sound afterwards. And uh, we know that the, this was used particularly towards the end of the Hart School's life in the late 18th century. Composers like Bach's son, C.P. Bach, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, talk about this um, bay boom, which is this sort of... And how would they uh, write that in music? It doesn't get written early on, so we don't know how much it was used. But by C.P. Bach's type, he, above a, a, a note, you might have a minim, and above the minim would be a sort of slur with a series of dots underneath it. Okay. And that would indicate that you should use Bebung on that note as an expressive device. Um, so it's great, um, you know, and they are fantastic little instruments. It's supposed to have been J.S. Bach's favourite instrument, but there are two sources for that, and they're both uh, considerably later than Bach's life. They sort of are sons of pupils and things like that, so we're not absolutely sure. But it certainly was immensely popular. It has most clavichords, certainly of the uh, 17th and early 18th century, have roughly the same sort of set of notes as organs had, uh, and there are even... Um, some historical examples of two clavichords. Th this is much thicker and heavier, well, not heavier, but much thicker that way than normal clavichords. But you quite often see two of them stacked on top of each other and then a pedal clavichord as well. <laughs> so in the days when churches were freezing and organs had to be pumped by paid um, you know, uh, organ pumpers, blowers, if I can say that, um, uh, being able to practice at home on a clavichord with two manuals and a pedal, uh, as you might on the organ, was clearly a, a mm. great advantage. Um, they tend to stay more in tune than harpsichords. They're more stable, if they're well made, they're more st stable in tuning. Sorry, that's the dehumidifier. Let's disconnect it and it go out. There we go. Um, so that, yeah, so that's a clavichord. And this, this wonderful instrument which has this particular loop-like quality. have a similar sound but um, this has a very distinctive timbre, a very distinctive quality um, which comes, I don't know, perhaps from the height of the instrument. It does have incredibly tall tangents um, but entirely handmade, beautifully made. All my instrument maker friends who come for other reasons are, are, are very very taken with things like the, the dovetail joints around here which are absolute perfection. Um, Peter has this reputation as being the most sort of um, careful maker, every, pays great attention to every detail. 
Um, and it's interesting, so that's a little tool compartment there, that's where I keep various things. But uh, I rather like this about this instrument. Most clavichords are rectangular, rectangular in shape, but there was a tradition, um, particularly in Italy, of, of, of sort of pentagonal instruments or whatever. Let's just stick this in here. Um, and uh, so this instrument is actually, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's this shaped. It's not actually a rectangle. Mm. And so uh, these are rather interesting. I think it's a sort of drug dealer's clavichord, really, <laughs> isn't it? Because it's got all these hidden parts, and uh, these, if I can get them, yeah, there we go. These lift out as well at the corners. Oh, my God. <laughs> actually keep anything in there. Gin for a dodgy recycle, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, there we go, yeah. So it's a fascinating little thing, and that one comes out as well. But it's, it's, a, it's a great work of craftsmanship and musical... Brilliance, I love it. So it's been good. They are ideally suited to domestic circumstances. So the fact that I, let's say I did um, five or six recitals in here, and we can get, it doesn't look like it, but you can easily get 15 people in here, plus me and Sarah usually tucked around the corner somewhere. Um, under these COVID conditions, we've been limiting it, limiting it to about eight, but um, just to give me more room. But it's a great instrument to play in a, in a venue like this. They will go in bigger venues. I've given recitals to the British Clavichord Society and other people in rooms that hold, you know, getting on for a hundred people. Um, once your ear is accustomed to the sound of the instrument, it's surprisingly strong. So that's that. And then this is another clavichord. Um, this, the 1620s. Um, so made in roughly the same place and at roughly the same point as the original of that harpsichord. And in fact, if you look at the keys, there's a particular feature of the keys. Although they're different materials, this double scribing of the lines there matches the uh, tradition that was used by the Rooker's family in, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, do I mean Amsterdam or Antwerp? I don't know, one of those places that begins with A in the Low Countries. Anyway, but they, they have the same pattern on the keys. Um, although these are bone rather than wood, but uh, uh, and there's a particular feature of instruments in the Low Countries at that point. And this is a um, very compact little instrument with very few strings. Um, uh, that had most of the notes, certainly in the top part, um, sharing the strings by twos. This actually shares a string pair of strings by three, so those three notes all play the same string. It's all right going up, but you can't go down. <laughs> if you're holding the highest note, all you'll get is the highest note, mm. sounding slightly tinnier because it's a... <clears throat> so it's a very, very compact group of strings. The other thing this has, which is unusual, is it looks as though the bottom note is an E, but actually... Um, and this is very common, a lot of the organs I play in the Czech Republic are like this, if they're from this sort of date, 1600. Um, they're called short octave instruments because you don't tend in the early 17th century, late 16th century, you don't tend to find that you use C sharp or E flat very much because <clears throat> music wasn't written in those keys, or even F sharp and, and, and G sharp or A flat down at the bottom. So what it does is it takes bottom E and makes it that key there and makes that a C, not quite in tune at the moment. The F sharp sounds as a D, the G sharp sounds as an E, and then you've got F, G and A, and then the first chromatic note is B flat. So for composers who would have been active in that area at that point, like um, uh, it, it works really well. It's a pretty little instrument. Mm. I'm fond of it. Well, I'm fond of all my instruments, but uh, very, yeah. <clears throat> so that's, uh, and that was made by another English harpsichord clavichord maker 
called Roger Murray, who um, I knew quite well. He and I were both on the British Club Call Society Committee at the same time. And he had a series of instruments that he'd never got around to selling, and this was one of them, and I was taken with it. Very pretty. You've got to be a bit careful, because if you, if, you, if you play a note, you're already playing, so you need to be... Oh, good precise. At letting go, you need to be good at letting go of notes that you might on another instrument yeah. hold down. Um, because uh, otherwise you get nasty jangles and things because of the shared string business. But um, so very pretty. And apparently it's made out of London plain trees. The wood is for this one, mm. which I'm sure wasn't what the original one was. I think the original one was just made of some sort of softwood, but... There we go, but a very compact and incredibly tiny. I mean, it's really easy. Um, I won't, well, I can just lift it off, but it's, mm -hmm. it's it, you, know, you, you can easily carry it. I can even carry it holding the stand. It just sits on the stand, but holding the stand together, I can lift the whole thing up very, very easily and carry it around the music room, which I occasionally need to do. So that's it. Grand tour of my music room. Yeah. What about the organ? Oh, the organ's not very exciting. The organ's a con. Uh, it's quite a clever con. It's, um, it's, uh, sorry, I come around and turn the power on over here, sorry. Yes, I need to know where the plug is so yeah. I can turn it off halfway through. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They never did sort that out. Uh, so they had the organ rebuilt, you know, not long after we left. I went back to play it um, for some concert or the other. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is an, an Italian company who make a digital organ. So they hang a microphone down the top of a pipe. Uh, on an organ oh. and store it all in the computer and this is quite old I mean this is 20 years old oh my now. gosh in fact 21 years old I got it in May 20 uh, 2000 May 2000 um, it's built to both look like and sound like the sort of organs Bach played um, so you have to sort of imagine then all the pipes above you one of the quite clever things about it is that the sound on this comes out of the top so you can't see the speaker grills mm. and just as if you were playing a real organ the sound comes Ooh. out of alternate sides real organs are set up partly to avoid putting all the weight on one end of the soundboard if you look at an organ it usually has the pipes doing that forming a v and that's because the two whole tone scales that's that side and that side so if you're inside tuning as I was down at the Kirk the other day you tune one side of the organ first all the way up and then you tune the other side there but it's sort of imagine that sounding um, on, on a real pipe organ. They're pretty sounds. It's, it's really quite realistic. Like all electronic instruments, the problem is the more stops you use, the louder the noise, the more one-dimensional the sound gets. Because, of course, if you think about it, if I play that chord there and I've got two stops out that's actually six separate pipes sounding six separate sound source and yet here they are just coming out of two or mm. uh, there are two main speakers two little speakers and one big woofer in the middle for the pedal notes but quite good I mean this this is this I like this because this is the low fluty low stop and you can actually sort of hear the air wow Yes, that's very good. That's good. And this one, which is a little bit stronger, Ooh. you can hear the air going through the pipe, can't you? Yeah. So it's, it's a nice, it's very, very useful. I mean, do you remember my favourite that I used to ask you for? What, did, what was it? Was it the V door? No. Bart Cart from Fugue D minor? No. Arrival of Queen of Sheba? Yes. That's it. I, mean, yeah. I haven't played that for years, but it would go something like... Uh... I haven't 
played that for decades, <laughs> literally decades, so I'm afraid I can't remember any more than that, but yeah. But it's very, very useful. I've spent all my lifetime as a kid, and indeed, you know, while all the time I was at the Abbey, having to walk anything up to two miles to go and practice every day. Um, yeah. It's so handy. And yet now, of course, because this is a separate building, um, I find myself thinking, oh, can't I want to go all the way over to the <laughs> music room? It's a bit of a stress. But, but because I have to learn all the hymns so carefully and, and you know, organ music and things, I, I spend many hours just basically just coming to terms with notes. But it's, it's, it's a very, of their types, it looks really nice because so many modern electronic organs mm. look like sort of, I don't know, a flight deck of a <laughs> Boeing or something, lights everywhere. <laughs> this looks like a real organ and the sounds are very good. Um, some people prefer a lot more gadgets on their instruments, but you can do various things on this. I mean, <coughs> the sort of control panel there, can I find some oh. glasses? I don't know. But um, so you are able to change various parameters. Of, uh, of the sound. So if I turn, let's go to, let's, no, sorry, I did the wrong thing there. There we go. So that's, that's, that's the principle eight. So that's this stop here. If I do that, there we go. So that's its overall volume. I can adjust the volume of that. I can adjust the volume of the bottom end and the top end independently. Um, in order to, you know, make it pro progressively louder as it goes up, which is what I've done, because that tends what they be like. So it's only plus five at the bottom, but plus eight, seven at the top. Uh, this that says rank, um, <clears throat> not really possible to tell, but um, if you have no for rank, then the, the stop, every note on the stop is perfectly in tune. If you have yes, then there are slight discrepancies in the tuning, which you'd expect on a real organ. So oh. it gives a bit more character. Uh, pitch is the pitch of that stop in relation to other stops. So you could make it a whole stop a little bit lower in pitch, which might add to the warmth if you wanted. I don't see any reason myself for doing that. Um, this controls which speakers it comes out. You can either have it coming out just one side or the other side. Um, or coming out equally on both, or having it so that it does that business I was talking about of having C and C sharp on different sides, mm. uh, which adds a little bit to the realism. Um, Colour is to do with the brightness of the stop. I'm not sure how much difference that makes, but um, so let's do it here. difference yeah it does make a bit of a difference but um, attack is how quickly it starts um, just like you know attack and decay really so mm -hmm. um, not really very realistic because it's not well, what would happen in a real organ there uh, well I've got this set at about two I think so not so quickly that it's but so it does that. Denoting the air being pumped in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously the... the uh, and then release is, is uh, as you'd expect, the reverse of that. That's more noticeable on higher pitch stops, actually. If, and that's it. Okay, so that's this stop here. Um, so I don't know if you can hear, I have that set quite high because um, on the wind pressure instruments we're on there, you get this. It has a sort of whoop at the end, a sag at the end. If I put it... Oh, sorry, I've set the... I don't know what I'm doing there. Sorry, I've done something stupid. Oh, there we go. So... That stops very cleanly. Mm. But with that 14, I'd set it on 40. Do you have any reverb settings or anything? There like are that? reverb. I never use it because um, we're not in a reverberant room. Mm. So um, I, 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 an awful lot of. That's the point, though, isn't it? Uh, to emulate that. 
Yeah, but I'm not in a reverberant brew. I mean, I've spent a lifetime, you know, playing cathedral organs and mm. at the Abbey, uh, and I'm very well aware that if you have an acoustic to the organ, there's an acoustic to everything else. Mm. So if you clatter on the pedals, that echoes. If you drop yeah. your hymn book, that echoes. And so the idea of playing an instrument with an echo in a room that doesn't have an echo seems to me really weird <laughs> because you're not hearing... None of these instruments have echoes. Yes. So I want this to sound as close as possible to... <laughs> I want it to sound as close as possible to a real pipe organ, yeah. um, and therefore the only acoustic it would have is the acoustic of this room. Mm. Um, it is very common. <coughs> uh, do you know it's so long? There we go. So that's off. So this is it on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like it if I was actually in a building and it was doing yeah, that. Yeah, sure. But I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of hoping for, wanting... Um, yeah, what I want is, is a sound which is uh, as realistic as possible. And it wouldn't be realistic to have this organ in here with an echo, so I, I, I don't use it. And the only times I'd ever use it would be if I were using headphones when the sound is actually just a bit unpleasant. But you wouldn't normally be listening to a real live instrument through headphones, so it's sort of, you know, it's a double, a double uh, uh, inauthenticity which sort of cancels each other out, I think. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, that's, um, that's, that's about what it does. So thank you, Anthony, for that incredible uh, performance and incredible show of the latest technology in the 1600s onwards. I hope you found that useful. I hope you found it interesting. If you do, subscribe. Don't miss another video. We'll get back to some more modern technology in the next video. Until then, keep making music.